Got it. Ah, here we are again, Dr. Robert Sands. So lovely to see your smiling, bright face this morning. How is your mind? How have you, uh, how's your lovely, expansive mind today? Oh, I'm good. I'm here in Washington State. Uh, we've got a weather improvement. It's bright out, a little bit of blue sky. So let's rock and roll. Lovely. Okay, so uh, today we're going to do, a. Um, uh, I've had some questions come in for you, people who are watching your videos and um, finding them, quote, fascinating and educational. And um, even, I think one word was controversial, which I really enjoyed. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> I thought... And then um, I've had these questions come in and I thought it would be really nice for people to hear your opinions on what they're asking me about. So um, I'm gonna just start with the first one. So um, I'm keeping everyone anonymous. So the first question is about, um, so we've talked about in our discussions, we've talked about um, uh, consequences being very useful in uh, development and how people are, are really helped by boundaries and having consequences. And one person uh, contacted me and said, can I ask you about what happens when there's too many consequences for people? When kids grow up restricted, constricted, a lot of responsibility and no freedom to be anything apart from what their parents dictate. Let me hear your views on that. Well, almost any topic we could pick is gonna have two sides. And this one has two sides also. Yeah. The side we talked about was the lack of boundaries, the lack of structure, the overemphasis on uh, letting the child do what they want, providing no guidance, uh, believing that they have some sort of special knowledge about life and themselves. So, um, excuse me. Uh, the uh, the other side of that is the over over-controlled child, the over-controlled person. So actually you could go back and forth and make the case for uh, some structure, but too much structure causes um, a number of negative side effects in my view that are kind of counter to uh, the ideal development of the individual. So I tend to honor the development of the individual yeah. and recommend they have some guidance and structure, but if that structure becomes too extreme, then you either get rebellion, which is a very common pathway, and you can pick the type of over, over consequencing, over structured, over over controlled. Let's say an over controlled family frequently breeds a child that's quite defiant, and uh, that tells me there's something in the human spirit that is not going to be subordinated, and they're going to uh, fight their way through life. They're going to push back. Uh, there are compliant children that identify with and absorb and take on. The framework that is offered, we would say those are compliant, compliant people, mm. uh, and they're rebellious people. So uh, I would say if somebody grew up in an overly controlled family, they can probably tell the story of their own emancipation, how they found their way into picking and choosing the values that they may have embraced and then discovered that they thought should be set aside or modified. And this is really the story of human development. Ideally, as an individual, mm -hmm. we all have either too much or too little. There's too much mothering, too little mothering, oppressive fathering. Uh, you know, you can make uh, a case for uh, either side being in excess. So mm -hmm. I think the question brings out um, how do we find our way in the world without just taking on 
what others have served up to us. Mm, absolutely. And do you find that people who've had um, a lot of restriction in their childhood, too many consequences, no freedom, do you find that after that rebellion, they seek to, um, like a lot of strange psychology works out, they seek to also, if they have families, they seek to control it themselves, or does it flip? And those who've had a very constricted childhood let their own kids go a bit wild, or do they follow their own patterns, do you think? Well, probably the commonest example of this emancipation pattern is kids who are controlled at home and then they go to college and they have no controls, even though the colleges have a policy called in loco parentis. In other words, the, per, the, the parent is also the college administration uh, and the colleges and universities are supposed to provide uh, a, per, a parent like guidance yeah. But generally, that is not true. And the kids discover their own consequences. They drink too much. They flunk out of school. Mm -hmm. They have casual sex and they find out it degrades them and they get depressed because it's not a positive path. Mm -hmm. You can make a list of what was prohibited in the home mm -hmm. and is then discovered through actual life experience. And then the child uh, finds their own path. And that that is a is a common part of human the human development, let's say that this is a common thing. And and I guess if you have a home where there are few controls, you and you've never learned self-control. And one concept I could throw out here is called the locus of control. Mm -hmm. The ideal is we want the child to have increasing increasing control in themselves, not dependent upon external boundaries. Yeah. But we all start with having no locus of control as a young child. We need guidance, we need boundaries, we need reality testing. So as you mature, you then take in your controls. You decide what you should read. I remember one of my kids said they weren't gonna watch uh, horror movies because they thought they were taking it in and they didn't like it. And so I thought, well, good. They've discovered how to regulate something in themselves. Absolutely. I was not providing it. So, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, that's what we hope for with our kids, that yeah, yeah. they develop a locus of control for themselves. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, that's good, good uh, food for thought on that question. Um, the second question I have is about, so this person said to me, so what is it when someone has seen an event, heard an event, even smelt, tasted, and you know, been so, um, so present in a certain event, and then they go into denial. And there's like, it's like they've never saw it. There's what is the psychology behind really seeing something and, and, and knowing you were there and everyone knows you saw it, but there's a complete denial of um, situations. What do you make of that in your professional opinion? Well, I would introduce several words that are the brothers of denial, we might say. And so denial is used to imply that a person is generally blocking out, totally blocking out something. Mm -hmm. So primitive denial would be uh, a common example in medical school is a man with a big tumor on his face, mm -hmm. but he doesn't see it. Oh, he okay. denies it. No, so he no. does, you might say that's primitive denial. You just don't see something. Wow. And it's like, whoa, how can your eyes not see that tumor? And even when it's pointed out, the man might say, well, I don't see any tumor. Wow. So the mind is able to literally not see the obvious. We know wow. that. But there's some other words that are related to denial. Lying is uh, very close to denial. Mm -hmm. Repression and suppression are mechanisms where we see something and we just kind of push it out. We kind of know it's there. We don't deny it. 
if we're confronted, we'd say, okay, okay, I, I agree that was said, mm -hmm. but because you don't want it for different reasons, you suppress it, repress it. When it comes to trauma, which is a, a broad human experience, most of us have had different kinds of trauma. You, you really don't want to constantly think about it. And so you suppress it or repress it. Mm -hmm. Some people actually, actually dissociate it. So dissociation yeah. is a mechanism of blocking out of awareness, out of our mind and consciousness, something that happened to protect the integrity of our emotional regulation so that we're not flooded. We don't want to be flooded with memories. So these mechanisms of uh, self-protection, you could call them defenses or adaptations. They're adaptive. They help us uh, regulate our being and denial. Now, denial is a popular word, and I think it's misused by um, like there was a push by the American Psychological Association to introduce nuclear denial disorder during the Cold War. Yeah, oh, wow. Because wow. they felt that people were denying nuclear war and that we needed to say, wake up, nuclear war is a possibility. Look at this horrible movie. You're in denial, you're in denial. Well, nobody's in denial about oh, we can watch the movie you don't but you regulate yourself and so they threw it out they did not give it standing as a disorder nuclear denial disorder it's one of the many disorders that have been proposed and then failed to get standing mm -hmm. so that's an example of denial and i think um it's so common I if Am I am I right in assuming that the suppression of one's own kind of experience re regarding denial would be based on things like fear or shame or guilt or anything like that? Is that why people decide to like the tumor on the face? It's fear of like having to face you might have well you've got cancer or or it, would that be fair to say? I think so. I think it's. Uh we're kind of pleasure or comfort seeking creatures. And if, if you're afraid or if something, uh, if you see something, um, and it's a common conversation I have with people who are in relationships where they have not seen the obvious. And then when it, when they find, when it finally clicks, and they start to see it, they say, Oh, my God, how could I have missed that? Why did I not see it? Or for another example is when you're in love, love is blind. And so you don't see all these red flags waving red flags because love blinds. So there's there's a lot of reasons we have to not want to hear, see, maybe smell certain <laughs> things uh, that are a part of the human experience. It's uh, we, we're been there, done that. We've all got some of this denial, capacity for denial, capacity to avoid or suppress mm -hmm. or look away. You look over, oh, I don't want to see that. So you look away really to make yourself comfortable. Maybe you could say to avoid responsibility because if you saw it, and you did not suppress it or rationalize it, which is another mechanism, rationalization, mm -hmm. which is more advanced actually, to rationalize something says, well, I saw it, but here I think this and I think this, so it's no big deal. You mm -hmm. kind of talk yourself into uh, the slippery slope of uh, being comfortable with something that normally you'd say, well, that's not right, I, I don't like that. So it's quite, quite a varied, uh, I think the topic really applies to human nature mm -hmm. but i think what you said there way. Uh, yeah i i was thinking but just before you said about responsibility i thought it's also like avoiding personal culpability if you deny it then you can just not have anything to do with it because you just like i don't know i didn't see it i didn't hear it i didn't i didn't know that was going on or whatever it kind of um but you just you hit the nail on the head there don't take any responsibility again the great yearning 
raises his head again. No consequences. If you deny it, you can't have any consequences. <laughs> it's like, well, you so said in kids. Around. In kids, we call it lying about the obvious. So it's obvious that a kid has taken something or broken something and they say, who me? No, I didn't do that. They, I guess you can say they're lying. But <laughs> if you really look into it, they, they actually believe it. They think it was somebody else. They're very prone to think, well, some, the, the, other, the other sibling did it. They made me do it. This, <laughs> this desire to yeah. get the responsibility away is yeah. very, everybody can relate to that because none of book. us really want responsibility. <laughs> oh, that's great, brilliant. So, um, okay, that's very nicely answered. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, the third question, let me uh, get this right in my mind. Okay, this is quite an interesting one. So the third question came in and this person was saying, if you get like a child that comes from a well-rounded family, a well, you know, they've got parents that are doing the best and they've got, you know, things in place and they've got discipline and love and the whole thing, good examples of, of, of grandparents and everything. And they seemingly have everything to, to germinate into this beautiful blossom, but they turn into a delinquent, you know, despite everything that you think you've done right as a parent. Do you think that is just like, um, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't really say this, but like, like a, just, just like some faulty DNA, or do you, I mean, you, you know, when when it's all there, do you think there's there's kids that are just born in a way that they're just going to end up on the streets and just, you know, never take any opportunity? Is there p people that are just born to be kind of, um, you know, you know, their own worst enemies, no matter what love and discipline they have and everything else? Well, maybe, but I think we're born with tendencies um or proclivities and a, like a tendency to please or a tendency to rebel and if you're in a family where your needs are met you might even argue that that can be a possible path to maybe not delinquency but to a lack of full character development the character development comes from the stress and challenges of all the variety of human experience. So if you're overly protected, let's say the ideal family would be that all your needs are met. Well, I would say that's not an ideal family. Oh, wow. And so, so we have to back up and say, if we're gonna ask this question, how can someone come out of an ideal family uh, with, with uh, let's say, a negative outcome where they don't care about people, maybe they're, they, substance use is a common outcome. That, that's very common that you have a, a healthy, loving child, they have a carefree childhood, they go to, can you really say, well, that was the family? I, I think it's much too complicated to, to attribute blame with one factor. So if you have a trajectory or a tendency let's say a child is unusually stubbornly wanting their way and the parents accommodate to that because and the way they want isn't too bad in other words they're, they're successful enough that you kind of ignore these traits that are overdone or in excess and then they go on to have their way with, in other ways as an adult that's very self-defeating and maybe antisocial because they were not brought up short. This is back to boundaries and that if a child develops a deviation, the parents ideally need to confront it, but that requires the parents to have a framework of realization yeah. that, that they need to do something. And most parents are busy with their lives. They're not sitting around every night saying, well, how is our child doing? And, you know, you kind of, the kid goes to school and you have your work and you have your adult relationship and the kids kind of raise themselves. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's like, we can't expect too much mm -hmm. of families. If anything, I think there's a tendency to over blame 
parents. This was big in the 1930s and 40s was to blame. Then it started with the mother. Let's blame the mother. There's refrigerator mothers. There's good enough mothers. There's mothers that aren't good enough and they're responsible for these outcomes. And then it was the fathers. Well, the fathers are this way. And if the father's not uh, close enough, you're going to be homosexual. And so this blaming of the parents. And now I think I've come and I've, I've been in that um, frame of mind to over attribute causation to the family or the parents. And now I think more of it is genetic. So I think it's genetic uh, modified by life experience, kids that are, for example, if they speed a lot and they don't get caught, they can go on uh, and if they start drinking, then you are then you have drinking and driving and then they're gonna kill somebody. Mm -hmm. And that's a big, and that can be change your whole life. And you'd say, mm -hmm. well, why didn't we intervene? The yeah. parents also mm -hmm. always have regrets. Like, well, why didn't we, why didn't we see this? Were we in denial? Mm -hmm. Why, why uh, like there was a famous guy that ran around giving a talk called, not my kid. Not my kid, you say. Well, then he talked about all these kids in these great families who were doing all this horrible stuff. They were stealing, they were drug using, and the parents had no idea. They were in denial, wow. you know, or they didn't want to see, or the kid was especially skilled at concealment. You got to give the kids credit. They come with their own energy their own intention they learn how to get their and to keep secret what their real agenda is so human beings are pretty complex and uh, individualistic they're all they're all individuals and you know what fascinates me is i've always i've always thought with parents um parents don't ever stop do they you know it doesn't matter how old parents are how old it doesn't matter if your kid is 7 or 27 or 47 parents never stop being invested and i always think to myself um you know surely there gets a well i'm sure there is obviously a point where you just think you're on your own i've 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 you know i've i've pointed the arrow in the direction i think is best i did my best i've i've given what i thought was my best uh, I've released the arrow into the world and I cannot be responsible for where the wind takes it and, you know, wh where it eventually lands. Because these these kids, adolescents, turn into adults. And at some point they have to go, well, this has got nothing to do with my parents. My parents gave me such a great foundation. It's the choices I've made and it's what I've decided to do. I've decided to uh, speed and drink. Um, I know it's wrong. Um, it's very clear, but I chose to, you know, do that and the other. And and that's what people say, it's right back to what you say, it's about the consequences and taking responsibility. And parents can't, can they? They can't, they can't carry that responsibility until a child's, you know, 70 years of age or whatever. It's at some point, parents have just got to go, okay, I did my best. Hopefully they can say they did their best. And, um, and 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 now the child, the person, the adult is on their own and I'll always love them and be there for them, but I can't micromanage every decision they make. Well, that's so, very well put. That's what I would call a healthy perspective about adolescence and emancipation and the responsibility of parents. Mm -hmm. And there are extremes of that. There are parents that continue to feel heartbroken about their adult children and they tend to blame themselves. Mm. There are parents who prematurely cast off the children. You know, I suppose there's that extreme too. It's like, um, hey, you're 18, good luck. And they give them the boot. So there's a lack of concern. Mm. I got in trouble. Here's an example of how I worked this. I had three sons. Mm. And I was at a dinner party. We were discussing this topic. And I said, well, most of my life, I would run into a fire to save my children. There was no, there was no question in my mind. Mm -hmm. But now that they're getting older, I'm not so sure anymore if I, if I will do that. And I was, I was raked over the coals by the women who thought that this was a totally 
an unconscionable position to take. Really? And I, I actually don't know if I would have run into the fire, probably would have, but I was trying to make a point that, hey, we got to let these kids go. Yeah, you just yeah, can't, you can't yeah. control them. You can't feel responsible for them. You've done a good job. It's time to move on. And I've had families I worked with where the only way they could make that happen was that they moved away from their adult child to another city and only did, then did the adult child finally flourish Emerge, because yeah. they were so enmeshed in this control, mm -hmm. in this control dynamic of, mm -hmm. of interacting with each other. So I think the way you put it is a, a, a wonderful model. It should be, mm -hmm. uh, people should listen to what you said and I, I really can't improve upon it. Maybe it's because I haven't got kids and it's easy to look from the outside in. <laughs> it's like the theory is, you know, probably easier than the, than the practice. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Okay, well, we, we look like we're on perfect timing for this last question. And this last question is, um, uh, again, you, you might have seen this, you might have, this, you know, the psychological uh, seen evidence of it. And the question is about, do you think, unconsciously or consciously, parents treat the first child, second child, third child differently? Do you think that parents can't help themselves but treat children differently? Do you think there's like um, a, so, a, a such a thing as, you know, um, an older child syndrome, a middle child syndrome, um, any of that kind of stuff? Do you think people can't help? you know, just kind of do it differently? Or what, what's your experience with that? Parts to this, one is the parents part, but the other is actually there's three parts, the parents part, the child's part, and the siblings part, if you're talking about birth order. So the parents part is that they want themselves to be fair and equal. But the truth is every child is different. And every, every child gets a different parent. So the firstborn child gets one set of parents. Then the parents are changed and they evolve. And the second child gets a different deal of cards. You might say, if you want to draw the comparison to a card game, mm -hmm. they get a completely different hand. The parents are probably less attentive. They take fewer movies and pictures. There's less doting. And the second child gets a set of parents that have changed. And of course, the second child being an individual will have their own role in this dance. They are then in a family constellation with a sibling. Mm -hmm. And they and the sibling have something going on and then they have their own judgment of fairness but that's why i like to say children are kind of little communists in a way because they're obsessed with fairness and equality everything has to be equal and of course that's ridiculous i mean that things would be equal because not only are you younger but you're less experienced and so you can see how this dance between the parents changing, the child's changing, the siblings now get involved. If you have three siblings, you have the firstborn and there's big studies on the firstborn. A lot of firstborns are famous people. They get a lot of attention and probably because of that, they have greater confidence in the world. They are um, kind of elevated and looked up to with expectations, the expectations of the parents lift them. If they are a golden boy or a golden girl, the siblings admire them and love them. Firstborn, and they don't all have that easy path. And then the middle child, let's say three, the middle child is caught between, and they. there's a lot of literature on the middle ch child syndrome. Yeah. And but the parents didn't cause this. It's mm. the constellation. It's it's the it's the dealing of the cards. The the die is cast. And the third, of course, is frequently the lost child. This in family uh, therapy, 
You have the firstborn, the middle child, and the lost child. Well, the lost, lost child feels like, well, the the parents are burned out. They've they've <laughs> they've given everything to the first two. I don't get much attention. There's hardly any movies or pictures about me. What happened? I wasn't loved. Maybe I was adopted. Kids have all these ideas about why that life is unfair. And they frequently move forward in life with this sense of unfairness and take it into politics where resentment and unfairness are at the center. So yes, the answer is yes, but it's not just the parents and by the way, the parents are constantly changing. Yeah. And frequently parents get exhausted. The well is dry after three or four, and they just really don't care that much. They're not going to run into the fire for the <laughs> fourth born or the fifth born. So I'm 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 really being a little bit silly with it, but uh, I think you get get the point. I certainly do. As I see it. Well, what I quite um What's what's interesting about that? Because I've always thought with the with say the last if you've got three kids, uh, the last one, the third one, I always think gets off a lot more scot free with everything. Because like you say, the parents are just like, oh, I'm not going through this again. I can't I, this you know this constant battle or this that the other that they don't get they don't seem to get a lot of the discipline that maybe the first two get. But um, that can just be some of the people I know that just felt that they didn't. You know that they, they or, or actually it's not them it's the the older two uh, brothers or sisters that think the younger one got an easy time with it and they didn't get half the hassle that um the first two did um but it's all about perspective isn't it and like you say it's a very interesting thing because you are so right they're not the same parents you know i always think oh I, i've got a quite an interest interest myself in i mean obviously me studying astrology i, I can often put it down to you know, the birth map of people's um, souls when they're born, the, the astrology birth chart. But I've often thought it's funny how you get like people brought up with the same values, the same rules and regulations, but the kids turn out totally different. But even though it's the same rules and regulations, it's not the same parents and they're not using the same tone of voice. They're not using the same kind of body language and everything else, are they? It's a really, really good point you make there. Mm. Very interesting. But well, I mean, for sure, that's very well put. And it really comes down to the fact that each kid brings their own life force to the table. And they they are an agent. In a way, we talk about these things deterministically as if kids are molded or caused by the parents, which attributes way too much power to the parents. Mm. I mean, what is in uh, clear is that about middle school, uh, maybe sixth, seventh grade, kids turn away from the parents uh, if the home is stable and there's uh, positive role models and all this good stuff. They then turn to their peer group and the parents become background material, the units of my oldest son called me a parental unit he said oh yeah all the parental units are going to the game or something as if we were somehow and I said what I'm a parental unit <laughs> so I thought that was funny and he's all of my kids turned to their peer group in middle school and I could see that the love and idealization of the father was uh, taking a back seat <laughs> to the peer group that's harsh <laughs> it's harsh isn't it because people then they you know they it then triggers um as we say or it kind of really starts to poke some of people's own inner stuff that they're working on like when you get rejected by your own kid <laughs> it's like <laughs> it's like the ultimate kick in the face isn't it but then of course they always come back don't they in my well not always but you know often yeah. they, they come back so well we're kind of out of time not That's always but Go on. What were you going to say? Oh no, I'm fine. Go ahead. I'm I'm good. Okay, because uh, we're uh, yeah we're kind of out of time, and that is so perfect. Um, thank you so much for asking those questions. I'm sure everyone that asked will be very interested to hear your response, and I'm sure I'll get even more questions coming in. So um, it's lovely to see you're really stimulating people's minds about themselves, their childhood, their parenting and stuff. And 
you're really helping people to understand their roles and uh you know it's a, a, such a great uh, gift you're giving dr robert sands thank you so much and um Here's to the next time. Looking forward to our next chat. And thank you so much for sharing all that wisdom with us. All right, Diane. Thank you. I enjoy it. Bye-bye. Okay. Let me, uh, okay, that's lovely. Bye-bye.